Okay, today on the show, we have a returning guest, Joanne Bolt from realbosswomen.com, also the host of the podcast, uh, The a B Word, which we'll talk about in a moment. But let me first tell you more about Joanne. Now, Joanne Bolt is a top producing real estate agent, a business mentor, a top podcast host, and also a speaker. She's fiercely committed to supporting other women and invests her time in mentoring women in the real estate field and all things they need to know in order to be successful. She's real, engaging, and she tells it like it is with no nonsense and all fun. After seeing numerous women in her life stop short of seeing their full potential of their careers because of limiting beliefs, she saw the need for more honest conversation about the ups and downs of being a female in real estate in order to show women that they don't have to have it all together to be successful and get started. She understands that every broker can show you how to do a listing presentation, but few agents will talk to you about the reality of uh, running your household and real estate empire at the same time. From there, the Real Boss Women community, the annual events, and the B Word podcast were born with the motto that we show women the shit they don't they didn't know they needed to know. Um, now visit Joanne at her website, which is realbosswomen.com. And also please subscribe to her podcast, B Word, which is available everywhere podcasts are served. Welcome once again, Joanne. Hey, thanks for having me back. I, I love it. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I'm really happy to have you on the show uh, again. And we, um, there's always so much to talk about. I, and I always think too, being a woman, obviously I'm not a woman in, in this industry is such a unique experience. And I think women account for like 66% of all realtors or something like that. Yeah, I think like 66, that. 67, according to NAR. It, it's amazing to me because there is like a national association of, of, uh, of women realtors, which is amazing. Um, but there really, I don't think is enough conversation around the experience of being a woman in this industry. And I have, I talked to top producers well, all the time on our show. Um, but even just in my private life, I'm shocked at how often I will hear them say, and these are top producers like yourself. They'll say things like, you wouldn't believe the way sometimes men speak to me. And I go really, even as a top producer and yep. they're like, yeah, sometimes, you know, sometimes it can get tricky. And so I think, you know, it's, um, it's something that doesn't get discussed as much. It really doesn't. And that's what I found when I, when I started coaching and mentoring agents, I really discovered that there's this common theme that happens, um, amongst the women realtors. And it's sometimes we just need to talk about the shit we're not supposed to talk about, you know, and it's, it's not stuff your broker can help you with. It's not stuff that's going to get taught at any other conference or class you're going to attend, but it's the reality of being, being the girl in real estate. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's amazing too, because women, I mean, we all know the pressures that women face in our, in our society, which is you're all, you're supposed to be perfect in every possible way you're supposed to is, oh, and you're supposed to have an amazing career. So if there's children, you're supposed to, you know, be in charge of all of that. Uh, and, you know, and right now during the pandemic, um, a lot of it has fallen on women's backs to uh, take care of the education and making sure that, you know, the kids are, are sitting in front of their Zoom meetings. Um, although hopefully some of them are back to school at this point not all, Thank God but are. yeah, <laughs> but it's still, it's an amazing amount of work. And, um, I've also always heard the expression, if you want to get something done, give it to a, give it to a busy mother. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it is, it is amazing. Um, and which is a cute thing. And we all laugh about it because it, it is true. Busy moms just get a lot done. And of course, not just, not just mothers get things done that are women, but this idea that a woman can run her real estate career have a family or a home life or a primary relationship that also gets the attention it needs and, and really do everything in a way that's healthy. Um, again, yeah, you're right. I don't think it's talked about enough and it's like really hard to do. And most of us are doing it between the hours of nine and three. Yeah. Because the reality is once the kids are home from school or off their zoom, you can tell them not to come into your office all you want. You can tell them not to interrupt you all you want, but yeah, they're going to. And so we do most of our work from, you know, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And then after that, we really have to juggle all the things in order to make life run. Well, I would love to dive right into today, which I know we wanted to talk about some limiting beliefs. Um, and I don't know if these will touch on this idea of perfection that, that we expect 
from from women, which is completely unfair and unrealistic. Um, but I would love to get into some of these limiting beliefs that I think or that you think are, are really holding women back um, in this in the real estate space. Yeah. So my my biggest limiting belief I see women have is that this doesn't need to be the primary career for your family, that it's a side hustle or that they're just doing this to pick up a little bit of extra money for the family to take a vacation or to pay for, you know, your spa treatments that you enjoy having. And you don't want your husband to always know about that you're spending money on. No, not like I've ever done that. (laughs) Um, And their limiting belief really does prevent them from doing the business at the highest level because they don't see themselves as the breadwinner of the family. And whether they are or aren't, it doesn't matter. They don't see that they should or could be. And therefore they miss a lot of opportunities to grow their business because they don't, they don't do all the lead generation and they don't sit down and do the P and L's and they don't look at it as a business business. They look at it as a side business or a hustle. And there's a huge yeah. difference between that. I've never been a huge fan of the word side hustle. And I feel like maybe that word's thankfully starting to phase out a little bit, but for many years, it was a real popular and I heard it more with women, especially busy moms who wanted to pick up some extra income on the side. Um, But I, I don't know how many people were successful with their side hustle. I think eventually side hustles ultimately can turn into full-time businesses, but it is really tough, right? Like, really tough I mean, to we make know- it. Work. So hard. No. Yeah. If you don't give Look, your mind fully to something to do, then it's never going to get to where it could be. And yeah. you never know the full potential of it. And so there's no reason to sit back and say, oh, well, this isn't the, the primary for my family. This isn't anything but a side job or a side hustle. So if you were to replace that for some, any of our listeners that, you know, sort of are, I, I would assume the vast majority of our listeners maybe. Well, I don't know. Maybe they do think that way. I don't know because we don't get too much demographic information about our listeners, but I I'm curious on if you, you know, what would you say as a replacement belief for that? That this is my career. Yeah. Flat out. And I know that that sounds simple and it sounds like, you know, a lot of people I say that and they, they kind of look at me with the duh look on their face, but a lot of them don't ingrain that in their brain. They look at it and go, oh no, I picked this career because I can go, you know, to the preschool during the day and drop off muffins with, you know, mommies and muffins, or because I can go play tennis three times a week, or because I can, because I can. And they don't recognize that that career really is a career. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if you're working five hours a week or 50 hours a week, it is still a career and you need to look at it as such. And so so I state the obvious, it's a career. It is a career. And we're not necessarily saying career has to be full-time, right? Because most moms, you know, working moms, you know, it's a lot to juggle and it doesn't mean you're going to be putting in 90 hours every week uh, and not sleeping. Um, I mean, you could certainly choose to go that route, um, but um, that's not what really Joanne is talking about. We're talking about creating just a healthy understanding of here's how much time I can put into my business, or here's how much time I'm willing to. And I'm in whatever amount that is, assuming it's a reasonable amount, I can, that is my career. Um, And honestly, that leads me into my second limiting belief, which is that you, in order to be a super successful agent, you have to work 40 hours a week, or you have to work on weekends. Yeah. The truth is a successful career for you is whatever really does meet the needs of your family, whether you become the primary breadwinner or it meets whatever financial goals you and your partner or you and your kids or you yourself has set for you. And you can sell a hundred homes a year and not work on weekends. It can be done. I've done it. So that limiting belief that in order to be that top agent or that super successful agent and not look at this as a side hustle is that I have to give up all my spare time and, and devote myself to the job that I'd like to shatter that belief because I know a lot of agents that literally do work from 10 to three, four days a week and sell 15 million in the first quarter of the year. I myself haven't worked a Sunday in four years and I'm at the top of my field. So don't set yourself short by saying I have to work so much. So now what what I'm hearing from our invisible audience at this moment is that sounds great. However, what happens when I have a client who says I can only go look at properties at Sunday at noon or 12, you know, 2 PM 
uh, and and you are like, hey, that's my mom time, or that's my family time, or whatever. You're busy, you, you know, and you've said you haven't worked a Sunday. So how do you how do you work with that? Because I know realtors uh, often uh, one it's one of the great uh, reasons that realtors are successful. They're people people pleasers, right? Oh, we want to be pe- we want to meet people where they're at and whatever time they have. N- realtors are notoriously uh, challenged around setting boundaries. Um, so what we're really talking about is setting boundaries. So you have somebody who says, "Hey, this is what I can do," and you now it bumps up against. Well, no, that's my, that's my, ch- you know, I'm, I'm going ice skating with the kids or something. How, what do you do in that scenario? So there's two things I normally do. And the second one is going to blow a lot of agents brains out there. Okay. <clears throat> the first one is I'm always up front with my clients. I don't work on Sundays. This is my family time. And this, you know, and I don't really have to explain it, but please don't ask me to show a home on Sunday afternoon. If it truly is the only time you can see a home, maybe because today we're in the market where if a home comes on the market, it's gone four hours later, I will have someone in my organization or team who can meet you, but you need to know ahead of time that it's not going to be me. Are we okay with this? And if we are, we can keep moving forward. The second so talk- one, the one oh, that'll real blow quick, your brain. I just want, yeah, I want to pause ahead. for, don't forget your second one because I apologize. I'm interrupting okay. Joanne, which is a ho- horrible quality of mine. So I apologize. <laughs> uh, interrupting women, by the way, is also never a good idea. I've learned in my life, uh, having been in relationships with women. Uh, so I apologize for that. You're good. However, I, I, I did want to say this is what she said is very, very profound. And I just want to pause for a moment and realize what she did is she didn't say, she gets the phone call on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. and says, hey, I want to go see this property. And the person goes, well, I want to see it at noon. And she goes, well, this is my day day off she, or my day with my family. Not a day off. and Probably never a day off for mothers. Uh, but this idea that she uh, initially, when she's talking to her clients, she sets the boundaries. She tells them, hey, here's when I'm available. And oh, by the way, if you need something at a very specific time, if it's the only time it can be done, I will do my best to make sure I have somebody to assist you with that. Um, However, this is when I'm available. So there is no misunderstanding. There is no miscommunication. Now, again, you might have uh, clients that test those boundaries, of course, like children (laughs) test their parents. Yeah. Yeah. But, But this is really, really critical. And I think a lot of agents are afraid to, to say things like that. And I think most human beings are reasonable people, not everybody, but I think most people, most of us go, if, if, if my, um, accountant, for example, who I would never expect to work on a weekend, by the way, because that's not really when accounting stuff happens. But if, if all of a sudden on a Sunday I need it, and she has never told me, don't bother me on a Sunday, but, but if I did, I wouldn't expect to hear back from her. But if she wrote back and, and, and said, even on Monday, Hey, I got your message on Sunday. I wasn't able to get back to you. It was my family time. Just so you know, here are my hours. I'd be like, that makes sense. I get it. So I think most people will be understanding of that. But anyway, I just wanted to pause because I think what you said was really, really profound, but she didn't wait until Sunday morning to then tell somebody, oh, I can't do it today. (laughs) I'm sorry. Go ahead with your second one because that was so good. So here's the the brain mind blown moment, right? If you don't want to adhere by those rules, I don't work with you. Yeah. And it really is that simple for me because I have nailed down who my niche client is, who my ideal client is, and I let go of that limiting belief. So here's third limiting belief that I have to work with everyone in order to be successful. And the truth is, if you can't respect that, I'm not going to work on Sundays, then I'm, you're probably not going to be the client I'm going to enjoy working with. We're not going to have a great relationship and you need to go find an agent who works better to suit your needs. And I'm okay letting a client go to find an agent that they're better suited for than to keep a client that we're both going to have a bad experience because I get resentful always having to tell them I can't work on Sunday and they get resentful always having to ask me to. And part of that really comes with, I've done a really good job over the years of defining my ideal client and, you know, catering to is the wrong word, but I know who I want to work with. That's who I market to. That's who I advertise to. I have defined that and niched down into it. So honestly, most of the time, if I get a client, I don't actually have to have that conversation. They know enough about me to know I'm not going to work on Sundays and it's okay. Yeah, I I totally agree. And I think we're moving, you know, we, we, 
we get so scared as agents to ever say no uh, to a client request, especially if we're newer to the industry, we want to close every deal because probably we don't have so many deals coming in at the beginning. And, you know, it's, it's, it, it can be very difficult to say, you know, I'm sorry, I can't meet, meet that need. Um, it, it, but once you learn how to say no, what I think that ends up doing, as long as you have reasonable uh, sort of um, boundaries, you know, things that are reasonable. Like if you tell your client, hey, by the way, here's when I'm available to, you know, respond to a text message or an email, or by the way, here's the best way to reach me. You know what? Don't text me because that doesn't work for me or don't email me or don't, you know, you can tell your clients the best way to reach. But I think, you know, setting boundaries uh, around, oh, by the way, if you text me at 11 p.m. at night, guess what? I'm asleep. My kids are asleep. I won't be responding to that. Now, there are plenty of realtors who just go, screw the boundaries. I'm going to I'm going to respond at, at, you know, 2 a.m. in the morning to sorry, 2 a.m. Uh, no matter what, because I want to be that fast. And that's great and fine and whatever. But I suspect without healthy boundaries, you're going to burn out. You're just going to, as an agent, you're just going to get to get to a point where your clients, they know they can reach you at any time, day or night. And now there's an expectation that you have to respond because you have been, because if all of a sudden, if you respond at midnight, let's say, and again, that's a really extreme Did they example. think you're going to. They, they, yeah, well, let's just say you do one time. Then all of a sudden, what happens the next night if it comes in at 10 p.m.? Well, that's even earlier than midnight. And now all of a sudden you're like, gosh, I was watching a show. I was relaxing. I was having a glass of wine or whatever, or I was just playing with the kids or hanging out with whoever. Um, I, I better respond. And so I think it, it creates this vicious cycle of, you gotta, you gotta be able to say, look, any other profession, you can't just like call an attorney up at, you know, midnight on, on a, and on a Wednesday. And expect them to answer. No. Yeah, they're not going to do that. But we all, all, we automatically know that sort of in our society, we've been trained that a lot of professions are nine to five and real estate oftentimes isn't. So I think this is really important is defining it for your clients and you do it in, and, and you get them to sign well, off and on And giving it. yourself permission to define mm -hmm. it. And that I think mm -hmm. is where a lot of agents go wrong. They- yeah. They really do. They, you know, they can't see 90 days out. They can only see in 30 day increments because that is the average contract that we do. They get scared that next month they don't already have closings on the books. So they therefore are terrified at 90 days out because they really don't have anything on the books. And oh my gosh, I depend on commission. And they don't give themselves permission to set the boundaries. And let me tell you something. Clients are like puppies. Okay. If you send a puppy to boarding school and it comes home or training school and you've done training and you tell that puppy, you can't get on the couch, you can't get on the couch, you can't get on the couch. And then one night you have a glass of wine and it's cold outside and you want to snuggle up with the puppy on the couch and you let the puppy on the couch. Good luck getting that dog ever off that couch again, because that puppy's like, nope, she broke the rules. All I got to do is give her my puppy eyes. And so they're the same thing. If you tell a client, I'm not going to go out on Sundays. And then you go out on Sunday, guess what? You're, they're going to keep expecting it. Yeah, it's it's the well, speaking of puppies, I have my 13 and a half year old uh, old lady Chihuahua is underneath my desk right now, who um, has whole sorts of health issues, but she's hanging in there. Uh, she, anyway, I could talk about that all day. But but when I first got her uh, 13 and a half years ago, um, I hired a trainer. And the funniest part and I think this is for anyone who has a, who has a new dog, please hire a trainer because the trainer came in and she, she looked over the dog and my dog was, gosh, I don't even remember how old, you know, I don't know, six months, maybe nine months, something like that. And, uh, she goes, okay, yeah, your dog works perfectly. And I go, well, not really like the dogs. She goes, it's you that doesn't work perfectly. <laughs> That's what my trainer told me. He's like, yeah. I have to train you more than the dog. I'm like, oh, okay. one hundred percent and dogs are, are are you know for you know dogs of course are a little different than humans but but as far as um behavior you know we learn by uh repetition we learn by um by consistency and what you're saying is so so important so it goes to my point about if you respond at midnight on a tuesday and again you want to you're doing it there, there's a real positive intention there of you wanting to help the client but now you've also set an expectation that that's when you're available mm-hmm and, you know, you don't have to come across as a unwilling agent when you tell your clients, like, please don't call me past 10 o'clock at night or nine o'clock or even seven o'clock. I, I tend to be very real and authentic with my clients. I think that they appreciate that more. So I will laugh with them and be like, listen, <laughs> I could answer your text at 10 o'clock, 
But there's a high likelihood I've had a glass or three of wine and you really <laughs> don't need me to answer your text at 10 o'clock. And the minute you, you know, you laugh with them about that, they're way more understanding than if you're yeah. just like, I only work eight to five. Don't call me after. No, be human, be real with them. And they're much more likely to respond to your boundaries in a positive way. And for like anyone a puppy. Who, it, 100%. And just like with a puppy, I am my dogs now, now, obviously uh, an elder uh, canine citizen, but, um, but I still make mistakes, right? I'm still not perfect. So there are times where you might all of a sudden realize, oh my gosh, I just now set uh, the expectation that I am available uh, at a certain time because, you know, I responded and what you can always do if you're transitioning out of always being available and people are still messaging you is you could always, if you want to, until you really have those boundaries well-defined, just say great idea or great question. I'll get back to you first thing in the morning. Like Absolutely. if that's what you have to do to at least, they, they will feel bad. They will automatically reply to you and go, I am so sorry for bothering you because that's what we do when we hear somebody says, great idea. Let me get back to you first thing in the morning. You're going, oh my gosh, I didn't realize it was late or no problem. Have a good evening. And, yeah, and but and, remember so, you have to train yeah. yourself to set boundaries yeah. because no one has trained you to do that. Yeah. Your that's, industry that's has trained you not to. <laughs> what other limiting beliefs are, are coming out? I think we're on our fourth one now. Gosh, there's so many limiting or, or did beliefs. We, or did we hit, did we hit all of them already? Well, that, that's a lot of my main four. Um, I would say my other limiting belief, especially in the, in the realm of being the girl is that we can't be the CEO. We can't really mm. be the owner of the business. You know, we can't separate the business from the personal aspect. And that comes a lot from watching, you know, the high D agents out there. They struggle a lot in their offices because when you're at the top, it gets really lonely. And yeah. so they tend to, you know, they're perceived as unapproachable. They're perceived as not fun to be around because they're just doing all the things that they have to do to run the business. And so a lot of women stop themselves from getting to the top level because they're like, Ooh, I don't want to be like that. Or I don't yeah. want to be perceived that way. Or I don't yeah. want people to think of me like I'm all business and no play. And the truth is if we just shatter that little limiting belief and know it's all in how you react to people as to whether they perceive you as being unapproachable and cold at the top. And then you can start to see the opportunities around you. But if you don't want to get there, cause you've made a, you know, a decision about someone else who's above you. And you think you have to be that way in order to be at the top. You're never going to see the opportunities that are there. I, I think too, I think you're so right. And I, I had um, a very, very smart person in my life uh, many years ago who was a really skilled coach. Um, one of just the wisest people I've ever met. And he had said, most people really aren't afraid of success as much as they're afraid of, sorry, I said it backwards. Uh, they're not as afraid of failure as they are of success, because as you said, they might see somebody who has what, what in their mind, they think that would be great. And then they go, but look at all the stuff I have to give up. Look at who I have to become. Uh, now I have to become the unapproachable person. Now other people are going to resent me and envy me. Maybe in my office, they're going to look yep. at me and go, why is she doing so well? Or he, why is he, why does, why is that. he so lucky? Yeah. Why would I want to be, why would I want to have, why would I want other agents to, to be like, Ugh, she got another listing or, 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 you know, whatever. Um, yeah, I mean these and these are real things that happen. Let's not pretend that people at the top don't have, you know, uh, some arrows kind of being pointed at them. Of course they do. Let so me as tell a, you when I was running my yeah. team at one of the brokerages, I was the number 2 team in the office and I never let myself get to number 1. And I never went to the monthly team meetings to accept the awards because what I found was the more I did that, the less the newer agents wanted to pop into my office and ask for advice, the more unapproachable they thought that I was. And I wanted them to come in. Like I love mentoring agents. And so- And you're clearly a super nice person. I mean, you know, but you can be perceived all kinds of ways. And so I quit doing the things that put me at the top because I just didn't want agents to not feel that they could come approach me. Yeah. And when I did that, it actually did make a difference. And so, you know, we all carry our own limiting beliefs on how high up in this business we can really get. And some of it's our own mis misconceptions. I also, I think, 
I am so glad you you had the the that you had the vulnerability and the courage to share that because I and and the awareness of what stopped you and not that you need to be number one. Of course, nobody needs to be anything. But if you want to be uh, at a certain level, I think too. And I'm just going to interrupt myself because I'm curious to get your take on this. I really think the business planning portion of being a realtor is is not talked about as much. There's a lot of people that do talk about it, but it isn't really built into typical curriculum of like how to be a successful realtor. It's like, what do you want your life to look like? What do you want your, the perception, you know, to be uh, of, of you as a, as an agent from your clients, from other agents? Um, it's really, it, what, are, what are the clients I want to work with? You talked about having a well-defined list of even who you want to work with. I think most people haven't even figured that out. And, and I'm not saying, look, I know why they haven't figured it out. It's not really taught that much. So can we talk a little bit about sort of defining what you do want in this business so that you can start moving toward as opposed to just going, well, I don't want to be, you know, I don't, I, I, I don't, you know, there's a lot of like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm worried about sort of what's going to happen to me. Um, so how, how do you sort of take ownership agency of that and go, here's what I want to become? I think the first thing you have to decide is what you don't want to become. Yeah. You know, like I didn't want to become the agent who works seven days a week and who looked up and realized my kids went to college and I don't remember their baseball games, you know, because I only got to attend some of them. And so when you start with what you don't want to do, then it becomes a lot clearer on what you do want to do. And when I looked around and said, you know, I, I'm not going to work seven days a week. I'm just not going to do it. I thought, okay, of my last eight years in the business, which clients were more likely to call me on a Sunday. And I, I found that there were two categories and I'll be open about that. It was the men, you know, the <laughs> corporate men. Sure. Or it was the new young first timers because yeah. they are all hopped up on like the, you know, the high and the euphoria of buying a home. And so they, they're the ones who are getting on Zillow at three o'clock in the morning and sure. calling you at, you know, 10 a.m. And well, they so, have all the, they have all the time in the world. They have so. all the time in the world and the energy. <laughs> And, yeah. and it's funny that I kind of gave up the corporate men and the first time home buyers. And I really started focusing more on the families that are kind of in certain stages of life. And they were more close to my stage of life and what yeah. I was going through at the time. And I found we had more to talk about. They were more flexible with how I wanted to run my business and the time involved. And they were more interesting for me to work with, quite frankly. And so I started really defining that and niching down into that. But it really also is taking ownership of a PL and understanding as a business owner that if I want to make this amount of money and I'm going to spend this amount of money on admin or broker fees or whatever it else it is, I might have to give up doing this piece of the business because I'm not going to work on Sunday. And so I'm going to give up some business, you know, or I might want to give up going to this conference, or I might want to give up this event in my life, but I need to add in this, this, and this in order to achieve and being open to, you know, coaching and mentors who have been there and done that guiding me along the way and building the business. You cannot do this by yourself. And I think that leads us into something that I know you're super passionate about. And I have the exact same feelings, which is finding a supportive tribe uh, in this in this industry. Can you talk a little bit about what that means and, and why you're why it's so important to you? It again, it, it goes back to my days in the office. Um, I found that I was super lonely at the top. And I think I think it's super lonely at the bottom too, by the way, because we by nature are we come from a or we're told to come from a thought process of abundance. But the truth is we have a scarcity mindset because we never know where the next client's going to come from. And so if you hit struggles, you had no one to really talk to. If you had successes, you had no one to really talk to. Or if you had the random crap that you're like, um, I don't even know if this pertains to the business, but I just need to vent and get it out of my system. I didn't have those people. And I've always heard, you know, you are the sum of the five you surround yourself with. And I really struggle with that because I was like, listen, I want to hit here in my business. And I'm just not sure there's anyone around me at that level that can really push me to that next one. And I kept having to go seek them, seek them, seek them. And when you start finding your tribe of people, you start realizing they have the same struggles you do. They have the same insecurities you do. 
they've been in your shoes or, or they need to hear from you because you've been in their shoes and it really gets to where there's no judgment. There's no hypocrisy. There's no gossiping. It's just, Hey, this is what's going on in the business. What's my next step. And you can talk about it. And when you can do that, you can hash out those thoughts about the business and what you want to do or what you've been through and kind of get it off your shoulder. And the path just clears a little bit more for you. And it's a lot easier to walk down that path. I, I could not agree more. And I, for those who are listening, who are thinking, well, how do I, how do I do that? How do I start finding my, my supportive tribe? Um, do you have some suggestions or advice about what they might do to start finding those people that they can share, share their life experiences with and support each other? You can go on Instagram, you can go on Facebook, you can go on Google and you can start hunting, read some books, let's listen to some good podcasts. You're going to get some great great people that come on podcasts and speak and, and you might be able to follow something that they're leading. I lead a, a group called real boss women. I'll be open and honest. It's a broker agnostic group. I started just for the women in real estate or our industry. And we have a lot of conversations about everything from what's the best way to do social media to run your business to, Hey, I'm a team owner. And I just had a team member leave and she was with me for four years and I just want to curl up in a ball because emotionally it wrecks me that she left my team. Like we've sure. got all those conversations that go on and you can find your tribe in any of those groups. You just got to keep bouncing around until you find the one that fits you. What's great too, about, about having a, a tribe. And I, I have a men's group that I, I meet with. It's the same men's group I've met with. I meet every other Monday. Um, and we talk about our lives, our lives. And one of the expressions we have in there is all of you is welcome here. Meaning your anger is welcome. Your fears are welcome. Your sadness is welcome. And also all the good stuff is welcome too, the fun stuff, but it's a place where you can bring the hard stuff. And most of us, especially if, you know, our partner isn't also in real estate or <laughs> isn't, isn't of the same gender or gender identity and is just having a totally different experience because of the way we differentiate how we treat, you know, different genders. And, and so this is a really important need and to be able to have those kind of communications with other people who are just like you, who want that, that connection and the ability to say, I need help. Uh, and not so much, I need, you know, professional help, but just, I just need somebody to talk to about this yeah. thing. And, and it is, it's, it's, it's intimate, it's vulnerable, it's healing. And, um, and it's, and it's also being of service to others. Um, and it's, it's really just, it, it's transformed my life. I've been doing it for 10 or 11 years. Um, I wouldn't change it. It's, it's just about the most important thing in my life. So I, I could not agree more. And real boss women has that, that, uh, that group they have, they have that function. Um, so we really encourage, I think everybody needs support. Everybody needs help. Um, and this is a great opportunity to feel like, oh, by the way, I'm not alone. And I, the, the thing I really set out to do in this group was establish subsets within it. So we've got a monthly mastermind for our moms. We've got one for our team owners. We have one at the beginning of the month where everyone comes together and we do some form of industry learning or teaching kind of moment. I mean, this month I taught on systems and apps that you didn't even know you needed in your business. You know, and so, and then we get to talk about all of it. And sometimes we laugh and sometimes we cry. And sometimes we, you know, have to pull our big girl panties up and just move on with the business because someone will tell us that we're being stupid, you know, and, yeah. and we've got that. And the best thing about, about it in my world is it doesn't matter what broker you're at. So yeah. don't come at me just from a, you know, a Remax perspective or just from an Ansley Atlanta perspective or just from a KW perspective, or, you know, perspective. I'm EXP. I don't care because we are all doing the same business. We're just choosing to do it in different platforms. So we've all got the same issues. Yeah, I, I really encourage everyone to find a tribe or certainly check out Joanne's uh, website, realbosswomen.com and, and join, join Joanne's group and, and really get a good sense of, of women supporting women. I just think, you know, it's so funny too, like us men, I don't think we're smart enough to put something like that together. Right. I, there's a oh, women's council are. of, well, 
<laughs> oh, we're, we're yes, yeah. Maybe we're smart enough, but we're. Oh no, I would say we're not smart enough because there isn't like there is a Women's Council of Realtors, which is such a wonderful organization. There is. And I no love men's... that group. I do, yeah. and it's you know, and, and I've learned a lot from that group. This one just yeah. we get a little bit more, you know. I mean, last month we laughed with the moms group over mom guilt for not wanting to go in all the time and doing muffins with mom. You know, like, yes, these are the kind of things that, yep, we're going to teach you the stuff to move your business forward and laugh with you about the other stuff. And that's kind of the difference. So the, the takeaway is please find your tribe and robosswomen.com. Robosswomen.com has a wonderful tribe to explore as well. And I want to sort of wrap up. Um, I know we were going to talk about sphere of influence stuff, but I actually want to talk about safety just on the topic of, I think women have to face this particular issue much more than men. I think uh, most of us would agree, um, realtor safety. And it's something that even on the show, we just recently had a safety expert come on, but it, we've only done one episode on safety after over 350 episodes. So I need to talk more about it as well. And, and Joanne said something very important when we were asking her, what do you want to talk about today? She goes, it's literally the most important topic that's least discussed. And so I just want to spend a few minutes on this. And a lot of it too is please don't skip past this as, oh, this is just common sense stuff because it isn't. And it happens if you work in this industry long enough, you will be in a position at least once, uh, hopefully never, but probably once where all of a sudden you you know, you start to get a feeling like, mm, maybe this isn't the most safe idea. Um, and women have to just be more conscious of this, sadly, than than us men. Um, but can we talk a little bit about what safety means to you and maybe some suggestions you have? Oh, my gosh, I could go on for this one for hours. <laughs> it's one of my hot buttons because I actually left the industry in 2006 after being abducted by a buyer right out of my office. Most yeah. people who know me know that story. I know you and I have discussed it before. Yes. It's still not talked about a lot in the industry. And I actually had a broker two years ago tell me I wasn't allowed to give my speech to their office. Wait for it. Because it would scare women out of real estate. And his job is to grow the office. And I thought, <laughs> oh, my sure. God. <laughs> well, his needs are more important than yours. <laughs> Literally, you know. <laughs> Yes, there are the, the the standard thoughts of do not go meet a buyer that you don't know that you haven't checked out. I mean, yeah, we've all heard those. I got taken from my office at a buyer consult. I mean, I didn't meet them in an open house. I didn't show up by myself. I went to the office. So if I could give, you know, one biggest piece of safety advice is everyone in our family has Life 360 on our phones or on our watches or on some, something that's going to be on all the time that anyone else in the family can push a button and kind of get a general idea of where you are. So if I'm not home by the time I told my husband and he can't reach me by text message, he can hit Life 360 and get an idea of where I am. And if I'm not where he thought I should be, he can get a little concerned. And, and I do tell that to a lot of women and they're like, I don't want my husband's checking up on me. Or the guys are like, I don't want my wife knowing where I am all the time. That's like stalker. You know, it's a safety issue. You guys, when I was abducted, I did not have an opportunity to call for help. No one knew where I was. We didn't have Live 360 back then. But now you've got tools. There are some really fantastic bracelets out there that they sell now that look like really good jewelry. And you can literally just kind of press your hand down on it. And it will call 911 for you and alert them to your location. And it doesn't even come across as a safety feature. It's just, I'm not comfortable. I need some help here. And they'll send help to you. So letting having the technology that we have today and utilizing some of that so that someone always can track you down, it's just not a bad idea, especially as a female, because you just don't know. And oh, by the way, just having someone call their lender and get pre-approved means nothing because they can call the lender, they can give fake information, they can send a fake ID over, they can get pre-approved and the person who meets you at the door doesn't match the ID that got sent your lender. And guess what? Nine times out of 10, your lender doesn't send you that ID anyway. They just send you a pre-approval letter. Well, you think because your buyer took the time to do that, that they're legit? No, that does not mean it. So unless you really do know them, you never show up somewhere by for the first time ever. 
So what in two and, nuggets and I, right there in one really great, really great advice. And I'm, I, you know, and I, I really am sad and to, I, to hear again about, about, obviously we know you, you are okay today. Um, but the idea that somebody would, would do that in your office is, is really, you know, unfortunate, obviously, and, and scary. And is there anything that agents can do prior to the meeting to really get a sense of who this person is? Um, to me, my, the first thought that comes to my mind, and I want you to correct me if there's there, I'm sure there's better ways to do this, is to even say, hey, I know we haven't met before. As a safety protocol, my office asks that I get a copy of your driver's license or, or and I, I don't even know if that would really be all that helpful. But um, are there suggestions you have that can be done in advance that agents can do to minimize the amount of risk? I definitely think that that is one of them. The more hoops your person has to jump through, the less likely they are to, you know, to proceed. We actually did get the driver's license. It was not real of the person oh. that took me because they were in it for the law. Like they, yeah. they had really thought this through. Now the average, right. I think person who's going to do you harm, the more hoops you make them jump through, the least likely they are to proceed with whatever, you know, you've got going on. Um, but it's just one of those things that the least amount you can put yourself in the potential for harm, the better you are and not jumping up on, you know, if a, if a buyer calls and says, Oh, I got your name from so-and-so and you happen to know so-and-so and like, Oh, I'm just going to go meet you out here because this house is a hot one and we have to go look at it. Being okay to say no to a client until you had figured out if it's a safe situation is worth way more than that commission. I don't care what that commission is. So taking time to slow down yourself as an agent and trust your gut instinct. If your gut says it's off, it's off. Yeah. Period. Yeah, I've learned that in in life that my intuition uh, is is some is rarely almost never wrong. I might not always understand why right. I'm having the intuition. And sometimes we want to ignore it, but sure. God gave us our intuition for a reason. And that's a really important thing. It, 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 it is, it is a, it is something inherent in us and it keeps us safe. Um, and also, you know, look, do not meet a buyer for the first time unless they're, you know, them at the showing, right? Yeah, like no. go somewhere public where, you know, a Starbucks or, or whatever. And, and again, I know most people who have listened to this already know that, but, but really have a bracelet, have an app that's always on that and, and have safety people in your life that know your schedule, whether it's family or whether you just have an agreement with other realtors who you go, you know what, here's my schedule for today. Um, I'm going to be checking in with you. Someone with you, even if it's another even female better. two on one is a lot more likely to detour someone than one on one. And in the last few minutes we have, I want to talk about, by the way, great, great safety uh, instructions. We want all of our listeners to have wonderful, safe careers. So thank you for, for making that a priority to talk about today. I really, really appreciate that. Um, I know our listeners do. I want to spend the last few minutes talking about, you, you know, what you've got going on. So you have a podcast. I um, do. Let, let's talk about it. All right. So I started the podcast. It's called, it's called The B Word with Joanne Bolt. The B word is a play on my last name is Bolt, and you can kind of be a <clears throat> itch sometimes in this business when you're a, a high D like myself. And so I started that podcast. We do two episodes a week. One episode is an interview with another um, person in the industry. And then on Thursdays, I drop quick tips where I do give you just some good advice on being an agent and how to get your business up and running, you know, everything from social media to what the heck your first admin should actually do for you, you know, cause that is a question I get asked a lot. Um, and it's, it's been super fun. I really enjoy it. Cause I get to know my audience a little bit cause we let them text questions to me for me to answer. And, um, and I go through them and I go through all of them myself and then I hand them over to my admin. So if you ever do DM me or ask a question you want answered, know it. I, I am actually looking at it. So, and you can subscribe to B Word from any podcast app. Any Just do a search. Podcast. Yeah, Apple's probably the one that we have the most people on, but um, Spotify, you know, Google, it yeah. is actually everywhere. But the and, and biggest thing I've got going on. Yes. I don't even know. It's your you conference. Know, what is the conference? Um, we are hosting our first spring conference, March 23rd and 24th here in Atlanta. Holy crap. Do I have some good people lined up? So I went with the concept that 
broker agnostic. So we've got speakers from several major brokerages coming in. And I looked at who our audience is and what they need. So I can't wait for this one. We've got keynote speaker, Giselle Ugarte. She's not even a real estate agent. She is just one of the biggest badasses on Instagram around. Um, and I happen to get to know her from Chelsea Pikes, who's a friend of mine. And they were both on Inman Connect's panel for social media. And so she's going to come in and she's really going to talk about how to get on video, why to get on video, how to use it in your business. And then we're always going to address, because you know me, we're going to talk about the girl stuff. We're going to address the factors of things like you don't like your voice. You don't like your face. You're scared to do this because of what you think you're going to look like. So we're going to talk about those things too, as well as show them how to really create some darn good videos. And then we've got some breakout speakers that are here just to help the moms figure out how to set their schedules, own their mominess as well as their business. And we've got some good women that are going to help our team leaders know how to run a team with grace and, and dignity. And this is at the Hotel Midtown in, in Atlanta. And um, I, uh, I, I have not been to the Hotel Midtown, but I've been to Midtown Atlanta and it is just a super fun area as well. Um, but yeah, lots of great speakers. I mean, look, this is something worth traveling to as well for anyone who lives in, elsewhere in the country. This is women helping women, top producers, people outside of the industry as well with all sorts of great ideas. And this is the Focus Conference. It starts in March, March 23rd and 24th in Atlanta. There's, in Atlanta. Plenty, there's plenty of time to, to uh, register, but don't wait because really make a commitment. Any conference like this, this isn't a conference you want to attend. It's not expensive. It's totally reasonable. Um, and you can actually get more information on it right at realbosswomen.com. So yep. you'll see there's a link right there. And it it's really, by the way, a very beautiful page for, um, Thanks, I mean, super fun, right? <laughs> Just from a web design perspective, I love it. I think it is so cool. But there's a couple different tiers. Guys, you really, I should say guys, uh, men and women, you really and should If a guy consider. wants to come, I'm not going to tell him no. He may, you know, find some of it interesting, but I won't tell him no. And you, you get can, a swag you can do bag. do the day only pass for the conference speakers. I do encourage you to come the night before and grab the whole pass because we're going to have a Prosecco party at the top floor of the hotel. And I went today and saw the venue and it's, it's pretty kicking. Awesome. Well, everyone, please. There's so many opportunities here. Number one, subscribe to B word podcast, check out the real boss women website, which is everything Joanne, but real boss attend the conference, March 23rd, 24th in Atlanta, Georgia. You, even if you just get one good idea, which you'll get about a dozens of good ideas, but even if you just get one good idea, it's way worth more than what the, uh, small investment is. And you're going to just be talking to lots of wonderful, powerful, successful women who want to help. Um, so Joanne, Thank you again for being on Thank our show. Thank you for having me. I had a great time. I love having you on. You are so much fun. You're so great at this. And um, people really, everybody should be checking out realbosswomen.com and subscribe to the B word. Uh, sorry, not the B word. Subscribe to B word podcast. <laughs> we'll put links to all of this in the show notes. So on behalf of everyone listening, thank you so much, Joanne, and thank you. who are watching. On behalf of Joanne and myself, thank you. Thank you. Please tell one other agent about this episode. Think of one other professional real estate agent that could benefit from hearing from Joanne, send them a link to our show. That's how we grow. And also tell them to subscribe to B word as well. So please do that. And we will see everybody on the next episode. Thanks, Joanne. Bye guys.